Um, so yeah, I think it's time for us to start. Maybe let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, you know because we have a allocated time, don't want to overrun or anything. So we have yeah. a couple of people join. So good. Hey, uh, hi. Yeah, there's two more joining. Three more joining. So let's start it officially then. Uh, hi guys, uh, this is Rajesh here. This is uh, uh, Rajesh Pravan and them. I am uh, working for Nginx for last almost two years now. I live here in Melbourne. Um, I hope the situation is getting better back in India. Uh, my heart is there. I hope uh, things get better very soon. Stay safe, stay well. Uh, so what I'll do before we start the conversation, I'll pass on to Sandeep. Sandeep can introduce himself. Sure. Uh, hi, Rajesh. I appreciate it. You know, you're joining from Melbourne. Yep. Uh, hi, all. Thanks for joining our talk today. So I'm Sandeep. Uh, um, I'm with Nginx. Um, uh, I'm, I work with Rajesh with the same, in the same team. I'm a solution architect as well. Uh, it's been a couple of months since I joined Nginx. So, uh, yep. And I'm based out of Bangalore. Uh, and I kind of take care of the India and the SAC region. Yep. Thank you. Great. Great. Let's start it officially then. Yep. Right. Oh my God. What is this? Uh, so the, the news, the newspaper all over. Uh, none of them look like a good news. Data breach, leaks, data leak, breach. I do not have a. I do not have a, yep. a Facebook account, so I'm okay. I do not have. A, Clubhouse. I don't have T-Mobile. Only thing which yeah. bothers me there is other other data breach thing. Can you yeah. can you explain like what is this about? Yeah, absolutely, Rajesh. So yeah, you are spot on. I mean, at least most of us have kind of leaving social media for some time now, right? Uh, we have been leaving. So yeah, we don't really have to bother about. But if you see, there is a huge amount of people still in those social media platforms like Facebook or LinkedIn uh, or, and even Clubhouse. Uh, Clubhouse is an upstart. So uh, and this is just basically uh, all the hacks that has been happening or that has happened in the past year or so. Uh, or you know, past six months or, or close to a year, and there has been an n number of attacks. Uh, specifically, because if you see, most of them are started working online, and all the uh, all our transaction, all our communication, pretty much everything is online. Everything is. Uh, Yes, and everything is API based, right? So, uh, so these are the hacks that has happened, and the, that's a, uh, that's a shocking number of hacks. So, I've just put a handful of it. We don't really there is number of that I've, that not mentioned. Uh, so, I've just probably pick and choose a couple of them, talk about it, and uh, so that to see what impact these hacks have made to those companies, right? For example, uh, the pri the the big one that I would really want to talk about, as you know, we discussed, is uh, about the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack that actually happened last week, and you would. Have I've seen pictures flying around social media about people actually scrambling to gas stations to, you know, to fill up those things, right? To fill up those gas, uh, because so basically what happened? There was a ransom attack uh, that the Colonial Pipeline company uh, and their whole IT system was shut down. Uh, so what the company had to do is they had to actually shut down close to 5,500 miles of pipeline that was distributing gas to U.S. East Coast. So half of U.S. East, East Coast uh, were not getting fuel uh, for, for their for their daily needs. So that's a big attack. And if you see, even now the company have actually not brought up their website. It is still down, uh, though the IT systems are back. And uh, one about the LinkedIn hack. Uh, we know that LinkedIn has been hacked in the past. This one is the latest, and it has uh, it has given out all the email address, phone numbers, and personal information, like workplace information as well, full names, account IDs, and whatnot. Right. So that is out in the public. And uh, you know, you you mentioned Clubhouse. You're not in Clubhouse, but if you see, there are a lot of people, uh, you know, trying to get an access to Clubhouse. Because as of now, you know, so to say, it is a little bit uh, uh, a fad. Uh, but again, uh, Clubhouse is still not secure, and uh, the hackers have been able to actually uh, scrape close to 1.3 million Clubhouse user records, and they have just left it out in the public. So yeah, so this is what that's... it is. Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't look great. It is uh, yeah, look like the data great. is we are we are not safe and that data is not safe. So uh, we need to figure out a way to be vigilant about how we can secure and how we can help our customers to implement you know, yeah. in a secure fashion. So let's yeah. actually maybe that's a that's a clean uh, way to actually start our uh, demo. Uh, maybe you could help me like 
the agenda with it and then we can jump into the agenda straight away oh yeah sure absolutely so yeah so we have a, a packed agenda and rajesh is going to fire up all his uh, demos and workshops for you and i'll be just uh, hand holding and probably just doing some uh, uh, you know talk about you know what we are trying to achieve by this right so the first to say uh, you know we are trying to focus on uh, the top 10 os uh, API security vulnerability and the mitigation that we get that we can focus on, right? So uh, let let's jump on, right, Rajesh? So absolutely. Right. So. Um... Yeah, sorry, go on. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. So I just so, want to mention that the probably the first one, right? I mean, this is an API-driven world, and uh, there has been a lot more API-driven traffic and API-driven dri business now than ever. And if you see one of the authentication methods that we use uh, specifically between APIs or between client to APIs is using JWT tokens. So tell me a little about, about or you know, show me a mitigation where we could do some kind of authorization, authentication on API security using JWT tokens. Yes, uh, it's a good uh, it's a good one to start with. Uh, so uh, before I get into it, I just wanted to actually set the stage. So what yeah. I'm going to do uh, the demo today is actually I have published the link as well. If if needed, I will actually publish that in the chat in a minute. Um, so that is exactly the same code I have been using to actually do this demo. So the idea of the whole demo is uh, I'm using GKE uh, Google uh, Kubernetes engine. I'm deploying uh, Ingress controller our nginx ingress controller as api gateway along with our ingress controller api gateway i'm also i have added uh, nginx app security it is a separate module where you can apply waf policies so it's it's a it's a combination of our ingress controller as well as app security get deployed on the gke and i got a bunch of microservices deployed as well as a, as a docker uh, container as a, as a pod in the kubernetes on the other hand, uh, we talked about identification, authentication thing as well. So uh, I have chosen Okta here uh, to do the authentication. So before you actually, you have a service, you wanted to protect your service, you want to protect your data, the first thing you will be doing around is to actually you know, implement, identify who is using it and identify making sure that this actually is coming from a trusted IDP or not. So in this particular uh, workshop, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually you know fire a request to Okta and they're going to get an uh, OAuth to JWT or YDC JWT token out of it. And without that JWT token, the secure the services which is actually sitting behind our ingress control will not be able to be uh, not be able to you know uh, accessed. So that's where I'm going to start with. All right, that's a great architecture explanation, Rajesh. Yeah, let's. Uh... So uh, thank you. So I have already actually fired up uh, the Terraform code. The Terraform actually deployed, uh, it's actually created the GKE cluster, it deployed Ingress controller, it deployed uh, the, uh, you know, the Nginx app protect policies, and also it actually, you know, deployed the web service as well. It, it's pretty much, it's a single click. Uh, if you, I mean, once I share that one, you should be able to actually, as a matter of fact, I'll share it right away. You should be able to use it. I'll chat. Uh, I'll put it in the chat window. Yep. Um, so I already fired up the Terraform event and it provisioned the whole uh, whole system. So let me actually take the endpoint. I have a couple of uh, microservices that's actually sitting behind. So I'm going to actually make sure that I'm going to make a call. I made a call and uh, the Ingress controller actually came back and said that now you are not allowed to access this API until unless you actually supply a token. So it will not let me to go without a, a valid token in place. So how did we achieve this is the important aspect. I told you that I have achieved this through, I mean, I have implemented Ingress controller uh, here. The reason why I chose Ingress controller is uh, Regardless of wherever it is deployed, regardless of wherever you're running your workload, you should be able to apply similar kind of a policies. So in this particular case, I have applied, I have uh, chosen GK because it's quite easy for me to, you know, spin up the whole uh, production-like environment and actually showcase to you guys. So one thing what I have done is uh, I have configured my Nginx uh, Ingress controller to integrate securely with the Okta uh, IDP. So you can see that I actually have a, a endpoint configured. This endpoint is nothing but the public key that was exposed by Okta. So any IDP which actually says that it is an OpenID Connect compliant, what it tend to do is while minting the token, it tend to actually go and uh, fix the, I mean, uh, 
it mint the token it then it actually go and sign the token with its own private key to verify whether the token is valid and the token is not tampered by anyone they actually expose the public key the mechanism what i'm showing you as a public one so this public key can be used to verify whether the token is valid or not so with a very simple line of a code with an ingress controller we would be able to do it quite easily and it actually caches that uh, uh, you know the public key and keep it on the memory within the nginx and whenever the token is presented back it makes sure that it verifies whether the token uh, is uh, signed by the right pri uh, private key pair and also it makes sure that the token is not valid so that's the idea behind uh, the services so let me go and fire hey, a request rajesh Sorry. before you fire oh. up a request i have a couple of questions i believe sure. our audience might have this question as well so the first thing so the deployment environment that you have is kubernetes and you have deployed it on gke kubernetes solution right so is it limited to uh, kubernetes solution or is it like is it platform independent agnostic uh, it's a, it's a great question. So now, uh, the reason why I select GK is because it's easy for me to actually go and spin up and uh, show it. From an Nginx point of view, it is completely uh, environment or runtime agnostics. So whatever I'm doing today, you can apply exactly the same policy in Kubernetes. You can apply the similar kind of policy in OpenShift. You can apply the same policies even in a VM world where you are running Nginx Plus as an API gateway. Only the environment get differs. But the underneath of uh, the, uh, the implementation, what we have done, the policies, what we are doing is exactly the same thing. And whatever we are uh, you know, able to achieve in the Kubernetes world, you will be able to achieve in any of these environments, which I just mentioned. So it's, I can assure you that it's completely a cloud or uh, you know, on-prem or, or anything. It's a completely an agnostic to anything. The, awesome, awesome. Great follow-up question, right? So you specified about Okta. I mean, that's what you have. You have spun here. So is it limited to certain OIDC provider, like IDP provider, or no? Uh, I, I mean, I I think you mean to ask that are you actually uh, tightly integrating this with Okta? No, not at all. Yep. So that is why in the in the uh, picture I have no, I highlighted that as a, like a OIDC jot. If any yeah. IDP. Yeah any idp like it could be an auth zero or it could be a um, octa it could be azure ad it could be uh, one logging or even google as a matter of fact all of them are open id connect providers so if they are open id connect providers we can easily do a single sign on so any uh, do like a facebook or anyone they actually comply with this one they tend to come you uh, know do exactly the same thing i can even show you an example of this so for example, if you take uh, Google's OpenID Connect implementation, they will have a published OpenID configuration like this. And similar to what I was showing you here, this is Okta's one, this is Google's one. So any OpenID Connect, for example, again, go back, uh, uh, I'll show you another OpenID Connect implementation called, uh, which is actually done by Salesforce. There you go. Salesforce is also the same thing. So all of them actually have to follow some kind of a standard to do this Open ID Connect, and they will have this keys endpoint, JWKS URI endpoint, where they publish the public key externally to the customer. So the API gateways tend to integrate this with this one, uh, right? A good API gateway would automatically do this. It makes sure that it caches this public key, and whenever it gets rotated, it automatically goes and fetches the new public key out of it. As you can see, more than one public key is uh, actually listed here. The reason for that is the companies tend to actually rotate the keys every three months and six months, and they tend to keep the old keys for a period of time, and then slowly they take, they take it away. So that's the idea behind it. So anyone who follows OpenID Connect would be we would be easily integrated with our uh, Nginx Plus uh, API gateway, or even with our Ingress controller. Awesome. So that's uh, a platform agnostic, and as well as, as OIDC well. vendor agnostic. Okay, great. That is right. Yeah. So now what I'll do is I'll um, I'll make sure I request to Okta to obtain a token. So let me actually check before we go and uh, you know uh, test our service. I wanted to actually inspect what this token is of made of. So as you can see, the this is a JWT token. Once it's a decoded, it actually shows the token header and token claims. It has a bare minimum information uh, to access it. It has uh, uh, information about when it is going to expire. All of this information is actually validated by Nginx before it passes the proxy, the service, to the upstream service. Uh, upstream service deployed, uh, upstream microservices deployed in Kubernetes. So all of this information actually, actually get uh, supplied. So let's actually go here. Once again, we'll go here and copy the token. Uh, I do this mistake every time. Yeah, you do. Every time I do this. 
So I'll copy this token. I'll put it here, and now I make a call to the service. There you go. So now I'm able to uh, apply the service. So now, before without a JAR token, you can't access. So at least the first level of uh, uh, thing has been done. Now we can actually clearly, uh, you know, secure the APIs, uh, the workloads using an IDP, which is you know uh, have a proper uh, open specification, and we easily integrated with that uh, specification called Open ID Connect, and we have secured it, right? secured the workload. All right, great. So, so th that's uh, you know an implementation how you know for JOT security, right? So, uh, so what about little fine grain implementation, right? So, what if I want? I mean, I know that you have specified that. Okay, user comes in. Okay, he logs in and he has the JOT token and he gets authorized and he gets authenticated. What if I want to you know put more, much more fine grain? You know, tune into his authentication. What if he's part of a group, part of a department? I mean, can we do that with uh, Nginx configuration? Absolutely, yes, because that is the recommended way of doing it. If uh, the breaches, whatever you showed me, it actually uh, it actually resonate with this one. Uh, there are two type of authorization we talk about. Actually, uh, in a high level, we talk about two level, two type of authorization. One is coarse level authorization, and the other one is fine level authorization. Even the fine level can be split into three pieces, like a fine, finer, and finest level authorization. For now, just for simplicity's sake, let's just talk about two type of authorization. One is course level, which we just did, a valid token, and it is not expired, and it is actually signed by the right provider. So that is a kind of a course level authorization. We said that, okay, you now you are at least allowed to talk to me. That's good. But even after that one, this, uh, there has to be some kind of a mitigation. It depends on the, the sensitivity of the data. We need to make sure that a right level of protection is made. It's like, a, you know, the next, I would say, the second level of uh, defense. In this particular case, uh, you could apply like a role level or back level uh, security or a group level security or any other claims that comes with the token. You can apply uh, a security uh, to that one. If you notice uh, with my previous uh, request, when I issue the request, I made sure that I am giving a scope called admin. Mm -hmm. So in the IDP, if it is properly configured, if the user is properly onboarded, then the, actually the scope comes as an admin here. So only what, the way how I have done in the service is to, if you are only an admin user, you would be able to actually access this API. Otherwise, you won't be able to do it. So here I make a check in the Hello World API or in the Weather API to say that are you an admin? If you are not admin, 403, forbidden. So mm -hmm. previous token, what I actually minted, I actually issued a, a request with uh, uh, with a scope called admin. Let me actually issue an, another uh, request without us without that scope. So yeah. that might help you to understand how uh, I have applied that RPAC. So here, if you notice it, I did not uh, mention the scope. There is no scope mentioned. So let's actually take this jot once again so decode as you can see the difference between the previous one here the scope is an admin the here the scope is an user so the way how we have, I have configured the ingress controller to uh, perform is to make sure that it expects the ingress controller uh in, sorry it expects the token to have the scope as a token so you can actually verify that in any claims so in this particular case i have chosen that to be a, a scope mm -hmm. so if it is not admin what would happen is uh it will not let you to go forward as it's configured it will throw a 403 forbidden so let's again go back actually i need to copy this request first And now I need the token. So token in place. Sure. I won't be able to do that one because currently the token is actually does not have a role called admin. So it's actually it pushes you back saying that yes, you have a valid the Nginx Ingress controller with that single line of a code. It, it, what it did was yes, you have a valid token. Great, but do you have a right role to access this api do you have a right role to access this particular method we can go to that level of depth to verify whether the user can be allowed to do the operation or not all of this happens even before your service is being invoked so it is not even proxy back so we actually push it back saying that no you're not allowed you don't have a right level of access get out yeah great 
Uh, perfect. So uh, just a, a quick time check, Rajesh. Uh, so we have 30 more minutes. So probably we will, if we leave 10 minutes for Q&A in the end, we have close to 20 minutes. So uh, we'll just go with uh, the, the next list of OASP 10, uh, uh, you know, uh, mitigation and we'll talk about it, right? So yeah, interestingly, so you, you spoke about <coughs> user authentication and, you know, uh, and also fine grain and uh, fine tuning that in with our back policy. But, you know, the user, user is authenticated and he's fine grained and, and the user is let you know in to access the APIs. But there are chances that there might be malicious content, there might be attacks, there might be brute force attacks, right? So there is something called rate limiting that we kind of apply to make sure that we mitigate that because rate limiting is uh, is a big is a is a is a tool that has been you know that we have been using to secure networks and now in API driven world we have to secure our application from DDoS and DOS attacks. So how do you apply rate limiting in 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 this configuration in this scenario? Okay, that's a good question. So rate limiting is one of the uh, unique proposition in Nginx. The way how Nginx apply rate limiting is uh, it's completely different from any other uh, vendor uh, in the market. So the way uh, it, it can, uh, in, in rate limiting, there are two things people sometimes get confused with. One of them, they tend to call us like a rate limiting, other one is throttling. So rate limiting, rate limiting is like zero or one. Am I going to allow you or not? The throttling is all about can configure a user saying, I am not going to allow you because this is what it's configured. However, for you, I will give an exception. It's like pretty much you put a hand on the throat and say that you drink water slowly. That's yeah. that's a, a classical explanation of a throttling. <laughs> uh, and yeah. in this particular case, in Nginx, you can literally throttle that way to make sure you're slowly drinking the water, you're slowly, you know, pipe the request to the upstream. So that level of a configuration, it let you to do it. Um, in this particular case, the rate limiting actually helps you in case the, uh, the DDoS attack happens and your backend system is actually provisioned to handle only maybe 10,000 requests per second or you know or per, per minute, that kind of things actually happens. So what happened in this one, we can actually you know configure the our Nginx Plus gate, gateway or ingress controller to have a policy to apply the rate limiting. So let me actually show you how I actually do that. So uh, this is a rate limiting policy. What I have done is it's a very simple one, as you can see. I have applied the rate uh, rate limiting like 10 requests per minute. And also uh, I have applied this on a, a remote address, which means any, any anybody actually co coming from a, a IP address, we can apply the, uh, this particular rate limiting. And also when it actually rejects, when it actually get rejected, this is the 429 is the code which you will be sent back. So you can actually configure this to a user or to an API or to anything, any other variables which is available as part of the Nginx. Just for a simplicity purpose, I put an IP address here. So that is actually configured as a policy here in the uh, Ingress controller as a policy. So this way, what I'll do is we'll try to actually hit the service. There you go. Yeah. If I try to hit a service up, so now what I have done is I have done like a 10 requests per second. As I said, Nginx actually handles this in a very unique way. Since you are only allowed to do a 10 request per, uh, per minute, it will allow you only one request per six seconds. So you can't actually fire all the 10 requests within the first second. So if you want to do it, you can actually go and do the, the throttling or burst kind of a configuration as part of your rate limiting. In this particular configuration, what it does is, if you're actually hitting it, it will work. If you immediately you will hit it, it will not work. You have to wait for six seconds to do that bit. So this way you can protect your backend services. It's not being bombarded so quickly. It totally depends on your use case, how you have configured your services, your backend services. Interesting. So yeah, this is great. So you used kind of a, a, a Nginx ingress controller policy to actually apply rate limit, right? And yeah, That's correct. Yes. Right. So, so my question, my quick question there. So, uh, what if I have multiple uh, URL paths or API paths? So, I can have multiple API requests uh, to different paths, and I could probably use the same policy or different policies to enforce rate limiting. Absolutely, yes. So what you could do is you could actually apply this. So currently, I have applied this in the server level, in the host 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 level, in the server level. What you could do is you could actually apply this uh, to the, the part level as well. Great, great. So that that's like control. 
control it so you can do that in the level as well so you can do it in that one or even in the location level it, it works uh, seamlessly just for a simplicity purpose i have applied that way but you can apply it anywhere all right yeah great great stuff uh, rajesh uh, so probably next on to it so talk about a little bit about you know application more specifically into how we could probably have our application more secured right so a couple of things that i want to talk about is one is the http protocol validation for example right so so at part, as part of http compliance like is one of the basic application security violations right uh, that we have so it what it does it it validates the and then also prevents the use of HTTP protocol as an entry point to that application. So right. how do we have some kind of configuration or you know something that we could do for this HTTP protocol validation? Absolutely, yes. So this HTTP uh, thing is, it's it actually more dictated from the W3C world where you would say that you can config, you should not actually you know poison your HTTP header too much. So we have out of the box policies where you can pretty much you know easily apply the uh, Sorry, you can easily apply the policies uh, in a way you can, uh, you know, mitigate those problems. For example, I'll actually show you the policy what I have configured. Actually, as a matter of fact, I have already configured that policy. It's very easy and uh, uh, it's quite uh, readable as well. So here uh, it's a lot like the policy name is called HTTP compliance policy. So one of the policy here actually says that the header name with the no header value. So here I'm saying that the header should be, if the header is passed, then it should not be passed without any value at all. It's the same with this one. So how many number of parameters I can pass as part of my query param? How many actually number of headers information I can pass the, so I can go to that level of uh, uh, information to go and you know uh, stop if any bad actors actually trying to send malicious information in the header. So actually I'll try to show you something here. Let's, let's try this. So as you can see, this particular request, uh, it's, a, it's the same request. What I have done is I have put uh, an empty header. Uh, it's like a dummy, and I'm just uh, trying to forward uh, the request now. There you go. It won't let you to go at all. It won't. It will stop right there in the API gateway saying that you you have not complied to uh, uh, the the policy that the uh, the administrator have set. But I'm I'm just going to push you back. I'm not going to forward you back. But it will not tell anything in this one because it's it could be an attack as well. So what yeah. we have done is we have responded back saying that we have an ID. If you want to actually get more information, contact the administrator. So you can configure the ingress controller or in the nginx plus api gateway to push this data with more information why it is rejected so at the time of rejection it will clearly tell in the log that it is rejected because there was a header with no value supplied as part of it that's why i'm rejected so that level of information is pushed to the syslog and then you can actually you know put that into any one of your log collector to to make sure that you have a right level of metrics or right level of logs to assess in the future Interesting, interesting, great. So yeah, I just want to point out that you know you, you specifically showed about the specific error message that threw up. Right, the HTTP request was rejected, and there was a support ticket ID created. So when I actually visited even in, in today morning, right, I visited the the Colonial Pipeline website. So they had the same kind of setup. So I wish they had yeah. done it before, right? So yeah, that, that's right. It's a, it's always. Um... The late response in this world because i mean uh, that's what they say right and with with the bad actors uh, they have to be right only once yeah but from us from a security point of view in the api world we have to be right every time we can't go wrong so even the small mistakes what we do in the services if, if you do not have a right level of defense uh depth in the defense uh, which is applied at the edge then there is no way you know you can secure your business because these days everything is digital everything is exposed to the internet that means you need to apply right level of security measures at the edge similar to what i'm just trying to show it's all simple problems this these problems uh you know uh, if you're not you know mitigated at the right level then the cost will be really heavy as you are showing Great. I mean, that's a great point. It, it, it can be like a phrase you could put out on your website saying that, okay, the hackers can just have to be right once, you know, we have to be right always. Always. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, that's an apt point. Uh, okay, great. Okay, so probably just let's get into a little more complex or, you know, harder way of where how, I mean, a certain vulnerabilities are a little more tougher and a little more sophisticated, right? And how yeah. are we able to mitigate those vulnerabilities? For example, uh, you know, let's pick the cross-site scripting and uh, SQL injection attacks, right? So, 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 you know, 
what what really happens right so sql injection attack are basically used to steal information from databases whereas the cross site scripting attacks are just used to redirect users websites I mean, users who are hitting those websites and where attackers can actually steal data from the user itself so i mean do we have the capability with nginx controller and uh, with nginx ingress controller and the app protect so how are we going to mitigate these kinds of you know sophisticated attacks that's a good one, actually. This um, among all of this, this cross-site scripting or SQL injection is one of the oldest, but still, for some reason, it's one of the powerful things yes. which actually people get hacked. So uh, this uh, talking about this cross-site scripting is much more dangerous because if you are not done uh, uh, in a proper uh, uh, vigilant with your API, people can send uh, you know some kind of a script that could install malicious software into your uh, system. Uh, let's say your, your API has got a query param or a you know, path param. Along with that, what they could do is they could append a script along with it. And that script can go and you know get executed at your server environment. And that environment, you could they could actually go and install whatever they wanted to. This is one, this is pretty much almost 10, 15 years old uh, mechanism, but still it's effective for some reason. Because yeah. this is very simple, people tend to actually you know, leave the door open. So a classic example, what I would show here is, uh, look at here as one, as an example. Here as a, I'm trying to hit my service, but here I'm also trying to pass uh, uh, information saying that, hey, I'm just passing the script as part of this request. So I'm just, just trying to sneak in. It's still hello world is a, is a valid uh, information. If the API is not expecting any query param, we have to make sure that we are stopping that at the API gateway level. So by hitting it again, so if you enable the right level of policies, which I have, uh, the WAF policy, which I just showed you, uh, it has got a you know, OWASP top 10 uh, policies that defined as part of the Nginx app product. Since it's been already done, what it actually does is it actually stops it the moment it actually sees any kind of a script that passed with the query parameter. It won't even proxy back to the service. Instead, it actually stops it and send back a response back saying, hey, I'm not letting you to go. Your support ID is this, get out. So until unless, for example, I have to go and if I remove this script, then it would work. So this this is this I would call like a more of a this WAF policies are becoming more and more cross cutting concerns in my opinion. So now yeah. especially bringing this and uh, WAF policies closer to the developers, they will be able to easily apply the same way how I'm just showing. Probably if you would have asked me five years ago, can you apply some kind of a WAF policy? I would have looked at you. What are you talking about? As a, I'm an I'm I'm an I'm an engineer. I don't actually look after all those things. But now the days the days are changing people it's, it's everyone's responsibility so that's one of the main reason as an nginx uh, you know responsible vendor we are actually bringing that security closer and closer to the application it is no more just an edge responsibility to also closer to the application responsibility so you can apply this closer to your application and you can choose what type of uh, WAF policy you are applying what type of policy applied in the edge what type of policies you're applying to the closer to the application so that's another other, other problem with the existing ones is a lot of WAFs were running in the uh, edge they don't tend to run in a blocking mode they always go in a, you know alarming mode they said oh, we don't want to block it because we don't know what would broke uh, what will break in the application side of the world with this way we are empowering the developers you choose what to do it and most importantly more in a more uh, in, in a friendly uh, developer friendly way sir Mm -hmm. uh, more in a developer friendly way, they can actually go and you know define the policy in a yeah. YAML style. If it comes to Kubernetes, if they're doing it in an API gateway world, they can actually define the same exactly same thing using a JSON. You can you can do both ways, but the, the every name value pair, everything is exactly the same thing. You can apply this policy and they can maintain it as part of their development process. That is the beauty of this whole thing. Yep, yep, great, great. So you know, yep. Go ahead. You you just said something. No, I thought I thought you also asked about uh, SQL injection, which is yep. which is also equally equally a problem, right? The SQL injection is something like when uh, again it actually get passed with the query param, where people might send uh, the SQL statement, uh, sneak sneaking it with the SQL statement, but appending it with the query param and saying that just go and get it. For example, let's take this as an example here. You can see that I'm trying to actually hit uh, the weather API, where I'm just trying to give a city Melbourne. But I'm also trying to give that R condition with one is equal to one. Regardless of this city is found or not, let's say, for example, let's say this. I'll search for a city which is named Rajesh. I don't think that's one, but I'll, I'll find one day. Yeah. But let's actually go and uh, hit this one. What will happen? 
it won't let you to go in a normal scenario if i would have not applied the policy what would happen is this pro this uh, request would have been proxied to the upstream service in this particular case uh, uh, if the bad uh, in a bad way it has been developed to saying that select star from the table where city is equal to rajesh or one is equal to one even though city is not present this one is equal to one will actually get satisfied. It will return all the uh, uh, you know uh, city which is not supposed to be sent. I I have a feeling that is how we have you know there is a lot of uh, when people say that oh we have issued like hundred million records being exposed, two hundred million records exposed. This this could be one of the way people would you know trick the system saying that I have a condition but I'm also appending an or condition to it to make to yep. trick the system to bring every information away so applying the right level of policy in the gateway and the edge you can actually stop this you can mitigate this problem at, at the gateway level itself yeah that that is a stagger, staggering you know thing so um, i just want to connect back to the first thing that we talked about where you said you don't really use facebook or you know any social media as such but yeah you, you remember you didn't have clubhouse and we we're talking about clubhouse where uh, you know they were able to scrape you know sql database close to 1.3 million so yes. i think this is the same thing so even the 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 attack is kind of 15 years old it is still sophisticated and we don't really have the tooling or i mean we are not really caring about it to make sure our yeah. guys are our we do not care care. until until we get the bridge yeah. once we get the bridge that's only a lot of people actually come to know the severity of it because the, that is one of the things which i always go into the secondary world i always recommend the guys to actually first rate your sensitivity of the data because without rating your sensitivity out of the data you will not be you you won't know you won't know uh, or like what what uh, you know level of payment you're going to do when it get get actually breached uh, with in this kind of incidents. So that's something which every customer should actually look into it. Great, great. I mean, this is great stuff. Uh, uh, yeah. So so moving on to probably I think this is uh, one of the things that we want to focus right. So uh, so yeah, we kind of focused on how we are able to secure the application, the APIs, and you know what kind of uh, you know WAF policies, what kind of uh, you know rate limiting, and how we are able to protect ourselves from SQL injection and all those uh, you know older attacks, but still sophisticated. Uh, what about we know that enterprises organizations are still having operations. Team. Team, DevOps team, but they're still in silos, right? So they might have a team where, which takes care of the OS and the and the dependencies as OS, but it's not necessarily that we can, you know, get into their environment or get into their work and say that, okay, you, your environment is not hardened. So I think like one of the attacks, one of the prominent attacks still in OWASP, uh, you know, uh, top 10 is, you know, predictable of resource locations where they could just probably, you know, get into the underlying OS where your application is hosted. I mean, it could be a container as well, but you can just get into the file system, discover your directories. So how you, do you think that, you know, we from Nginx can do uh, some kind of production and mitigation for this, this uh, vulnerability as well? Yeah, this is actually equally dangerous, similar to whatever we just talked, like a SQL injection and things. So it could it could be uh, done by an insider as well, or it could be like a, since it's actually you know a predictable one. Anyone can actually say that if I issue a command along with my query param or some kind of my request, what if I'm able to bring something from a, a, a file that is sitting in this particular location? or a, a specific information coming from this. So it's, that's why it's a, just, just predicting it. As I said earlier, they have to be only once they have to be right. Yeah. So yeah, unfortunately, right. if that one time they succeed, that's where the, the, the uh, what we people actually tend to pay back for that one miss one time success is really heavy. So I'll show you an example uh, how that actually happens. So here you, you can see that um, what I'm trying to do is in a weather uh, API, I'm actually trying to do a, 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 I'm trying to crack the ADC slash password. As you know that in all the Linux environment, the passwords tend to be stored in this particular environment, uh, in that particular file. So it's pretty much, I'm trying to predict if your operating system is not properly patched, if it, uh, if it doesn't actually have a right level of security, if it doesn't actually, you know, uh, have a, a, a proper uh, minimized access for that application, then this, this might, this hack might work. And 
again and again it's been it's pretty old technique but it's still and today it actually works so applying the right level of OS top 10 policies using nginx app protect here i'm able to quite easily mitigate it again i get the similar pro, uh, similar error message saying that your request is rejected i'm not letting you to go move forward this is your support already carried out so the only way i can actually make it to happen is i have to send a legitimate request because i have made sure that i'm not sending i'm not letting you to forward any empty header request i'm not letting you to pass you know forward uh, too many query params as well it has to be you know contained within five five query params with for each request and not to send scripts and things so this is all pretty much you know part of the os top 10 policy we have already uh, uh, pretty much uh, we have done that one so let me let me try when when i came out of the country it was it was called madras so still i'll give it a shot <laughs> you want to try that uh, yeah i was now it changed to chennai now but uh you okay. can time that they call the madras so yeah there you go that's the or uh, the weather ipi so if you do not actually supply the right clicker request then it won't even let you to go forward at all so that concludes yep. your uh you know that uh, predictable when we, where you can stop uh that level of attack great I mean, this has been awesome, and I believe that our audience as well would have taken, uh, you know, a lot of uh, takeaways. I mean, key takeaways from the discussion that uh, we had. And Rajesh is is been great. Uh, you know, your workshop and you know the configurations and your ideas. I know that you could talk for hours about API security and API, but I think we have few more minutes. So, if you have any final words before we uh, get in some Q and A, and uh, you know. Yeah, look for a okay, I can maybe I will uh, I can wrap it up with a few things. Uh, whatever we showed today is more more towards the OS top ten. So nginx app protect is not uh, you know bounded to that uh, simple use case. To us, it is very simple use case. So FI is well known for its security presence. Uh, it has got a dedicated security researchers where they do like you know do researches and find out all those vulnerabilities happening in the internet, and they have, they put a lot of effort with the, with our advanced wife. What's actually most of our vendors actually tend to run. We are trying to bring those policies, those level of sophistication, whatever your guys are running, closer to the nginx as well. As I mentioned earlier. The WAF policies, which we've been, uh, you know, historically been running on the edge in the in one of the hardware platforms, we are bringing the same capabilities, similar level of a powerful, uh, you know, policies to mitigate those attacks closer to the application. So that is the idea behind it. So uh, as I mentioned, it is not just about the OWASP top ten. We do a threat campaign. Uh, threat campaign means if there is a vulnerability in a specific uh, language or even in a specific server, you can actually that comes as a CVE. So you can quite easily apply the uh, Nginx app protect in front of that. So you can actually run those server for a period of time until you go and patch it or you go and actually upgrade that server from, you know, for let's say Java 8 to Java 10, you can actually take a bit more time to do that if you apply the right level of policy at the edge. What happens normally in an in enterprise world is it is not quite easy to go and update the server environment. It minimum will take three months to go and upgrade a server from one environment to another environment. You can't keep it open. You have to apply that level of a CVE. So uh, either you go and uh, talk to the network guys to do it or running Nginx app product closer to your applications could help you to do that because it's going to be for a period of time. After a period of time, you're going to take that away. So this is to make sure that this whole security, the API security practice, what from a FI point of view, we are trying to bring that uh, movement, uh, bring that uh, uh, empowerment closer to the applications so they can actually apply it, they can manage it, they can life cycle it the way how they how they do it for their application. So I haven't, I, I actually realized one thing while I was going through it, the code, uh, this is the location, I have not checked in some of the code, which I will do right after this. Uh, I just noticed there are 16 files, which I have not done, which I will uh, check in and uh, yeah, that could be, you know, used for you guys. Whatever I just did, you can run it on your machine. All you have to do is you have to re request for an Nginx Plus a license through our website. If you do that one, once you get the license, you can pretty much, you know, run, run this by a single click. I have given all the instruction, whatever I just did, I have given all the instruction here. So you could run whatever I just did, you could run it in uh, GKE, you can run it in AKS, and even you can run it in your local uh, Docker desktop. So feel free to call us or, you know, you can run, uh, this is purely for Kubernetes side of the world. And we will also, we can also do achieve the similar level of, uh, you know, fancy things in, uh, in a VM world as well. Is there any questions Wait. there? 
Uh, we don't have any questions as such uh, okay. coming in. So, but I have probably yeah i don't see any uh but i have a question right so uh, i mean sure. so we, we talked uh, you, you talked about uh, you know you know app protect right security being close to the developers right and closed so i believe there is I mean, how are we going to do that from a cicd pipeline standpoint how is nginx placed there I and mean, how how can you can you talk a little bit about that sorry sorry can you come back can you uh, rephrase it sorry yeah. I, okay I get sorry yeah so maybe it's my mic <laughs> All right. So what I was trying to say is, um, and how is Nginx close to the developers, right? And how is Nginx uh, app protect is able to protect them in their, you know, in their pipeline, in their CI/CD pipeline, in the development cycle. So how how do you do it? And if you have, you know, some suggestions or absolutely. So uh, if if uh, if you go and rank it, uh, the the most CI/CD fr friendly tool in in uh, right now available in the market is nginx it's most easiest way you can configure the nginx plus as a uh, you know as a, if you want to low, run as a load balancer or if you run that as an api gateway you can pretty much easily configure that with your ecac in this particular case i won't go into the api gateway side of the world i will more talk from aks sorry uh, from a kubernetes side where you can run nginx as an ingress controller it's pretty much as an ingress controller it is serving as an api gateway for that kubernetes cluster so I have I have shown you a few examples as well, right? For example, I mean, uh, all of this is like an ML file where you can apply this kubectl. For example, if you are running a Helm or if you're running some kind of CACD pipeline, you can quite easily execute all of this. That's one of the main reasons I actually used Terraform. The whole thing I have used Terraform to deploy it and test it. I didn't do anything manually at all. So if you are running a Terraform or if you are running an Ansible, if you are running, you know, Chef or Puppet, you can pretty much you can push do the exactly the same thing what I did in Terraform and push it to a, a you know relevant environment. So my code itself is a classic example for your question. So yep. I have written that using absolutely. Terraform. So that is a classic example, of, you know, answer for your. You know, yeah, absolutely. Question. Yeah, right. So awesome. So we will probably wait. Yeah, we have a few more minutes. Uh, I think Asutosh was asking. Yeah, that is right. Uh, this app protect package is not available straight away. All you have to do is you. It only work. The app protect only works with Nginx Plus. So it is like a dynamic module that comes with the Nginx Plus. So you have Nginx Plus as a base, and you if you add that uh, Nginx Plus uh, app protect Nginx app protect as a dynamic module, it automatically installs that app protect into uh, Nginx Plus. So you don't have to do anything specific. It is not like a separate installation. It is just an add-on on top of Nginx Plus. All right. So, yeah, I yeah I don't see any questions coming in after that. Um, I think we are good. So yeah. All right. You wanna maybe you yep. wait for a minute, two minutes because it's uh, it's only two minutes to go. If anybody. Yeah. Something to for it. Sure. So I'll, uh, I'll try to push this code uh, tonight so that anybody can actually you know, pick this code and they would be able to run on their uh, relevant environment. Awesome. Uh, well, no more questions are coming. So that is good. I think I you want to talk more about API? <laughs> I, want to wrap I, can, I can, I can, I can, talk about that for uh, days. I know that's <laughs> that's a, that's the only thing I know better. I don't know anything else. So, <laughs> it's, spe specifically around Open ID Connect, I'm happy to talk. Uh, you know, much more, but I think uh, don't want to overwhelm it. Maybe we we will do that a separate session on just on Open ID Connect and uh, Nginx Plus, how they integrate seamlessly. Yeah, and by the way, there are a lot of uh, you know Open ID Connect and specific topics on YouTube as well. So you should probably check that out, uh, done by Rajesh. So yeah, it's great. It's great content, guys. Yeah. Yes, I have done some of the live stream in the past. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, I think, man, I think uh, uh, probably uh, yeah, let's top of the let's hour. wrap it up. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much for uh, coming. If you need any help, please reach us out. Uh, Happy to help anytime. Yep, anytime. Thank you all. I appreciate all your uh, time today for the session. And thanks, Rajesh. I know it's late in Melbourne. So, yeah. Oh, all right. I get going. No worries. Cheers, man. All right. Yeah. Cheers. Bye, guys. Bye. Guys. Yeah. Bye.